So welcome everyone to track B, session two, supporting staff and families' mental health during COVID-19. We have Catherine Teasdale Edwards here this morning to present to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I first want to acknowledge that there is, I'm sure, a wealth of knowledge in the room. Um, so I'm hoping that the information that I provide to you today either refreshes what you know or rejuvenates what you know or hopefully gives you a new perspective. So again, I'm Catherine Teasdale Edwards and I'm actually a school counselor with the Syracuse City School District. I'm duly certified in rehabilitation counseling and school counseling. So my role with the city is to provide transition services to our high school students. So welcome everybody and thanks for being here today. There are going to be four main areas that I do for this presentation. So um, let me pull up the PowerPoint. So this is our topic for the day, supporting students, staff, and families' mental health during COVID-19. This is one of the areas that I'll be covering today, which is recognizing your value and acknowledging your strengths, both for yourself as well as your children or the students that you work with. Then we're going to move on to everyday stress versus feeling overwhelmed and how the impact of COVID-19 uh, requires us to tap into internal strategies that we may or may not know that we have or that our students and sons and daughters may not know that they have. I'm gonna also talk about building social connections in a virtual world um, as we know, um, as we look to the future, it does seem that we will have a combination of virtual learning and in-person learning, as well as virtual meetings and in-person meetings. Um, there really does appear that there will be an entire shift in education moving forward. Um, and so it falls on us as uh, educators and families to make sure that we are staying up with those resources and getting the support that we need to tap into those resources. And then last but not least, I'm going to talk about the power of strength-based trauma-sensitive communication. And we'll focus on how our presence, awareness, and language can create hopeful, safe, and loving, nurturing environments. So first up, section one, recognizing our value and supporting each other and our students. So as you can see, um, there are four specific bullets that I put on this slide. And it's important to understand that we as adults and supporting the students that we work with, that we remain ever present for them. Um, and recognizing that they may not know what strategies they can use in order to manage, um, manage the, their environment or themselves. So strategies that you have in your tool bag can just decrease stress both for yourself and the students that you work with. So some of these examples that I've put down are um, you know, really working on our self-talk, what we're saying to ourselves internally uh, when we come across challenging or difficult situations day to day. It also could include um, de-stressors like listening to music or changing up a classroom space. Um, exercise, of course, is a wonderful way to reduce stress and laughter, seeing seeing the fun in what the students are learning and that what we're supporting each other with and bringing laughter into the home as well during this really challenging time. So we also wanna honor the po positive contributions that you make every day 
You may not be aware of some of the things that you manage personally every day, especially during this time. Um, getting, getting up, being to work on time, being to school on time, uh, managing a routine, managing a home. Um, for students who are 100% uh, virtual, that could mean turning on their camera every day or just being present in class with camera off, being there every day. Um, it is really hard to push forward during these times when there are so many unknowns. And kids are genuinely fearful sometimes of going into school, especially after months and months and months of um, perhaps being at home. So just recognizing what they do and what you do each day to move forward. Encouraging positive perspective in ourselves and others. And I use the example of, I want that energy. So I bet we can all think of people who are in our lives who have maintained a positive perspective, uh, have been thankful for the daily contributions that come into their life. And it can be hard to recognize those, but it's important to be around people who also um, push us forward and have positive energy. So I want that energy means exactly seeking out the kinds of things that make you feel good and make your students feel well. And then offer out and reach out to resources and colleagues. During this time, many of us have felt like we're in our own little bubbles. Um, our own little worlds and the routine of the day can make that feel especially true. Uh, I know a lot of teachers, for example, who have had to adjust and teach virtually. And that in some ways creates barriers for connecting with other colleagues to really look at best practices that are uh, virtual or will be back in person. So just make sure that you're, if you recognize that you're headed into your little bubble and you haven't been interacting with other people, or maybe you know students who could use someone to reach out to them, not just virtually, but over the phone, or um, if it's allowed in-person visits, front porch visits is what I call them. So just being super cognizant of not staying in our own little bubbles. So the next part of recognizing our values means making sure that we understand as uh, adults that curriculum delivery looks and feels very different for our students during this time. It also means that a lot of districts are pushing really hard to reevaluate curriculum and how it's delivered, setting reasonable expectations for uh, parents, staff, um, students, whether they are in person or virtually, and also reminding people of what those expectations are. We want to meet them um, halfway really, because especially for students, we want to remain with high expectations at the same time acknowledging that this is a time like no other. And what can we do to help them with their learning? Teaching students how to cope with this adversity, pointing out the things that they're doing on a daily basis that contribute to their overall well being by showing up to class, establishing relationships, working on building relationships outside of the classroom always leads to greater product productivity, right? So we know that when we're in relationship with each other and with our students, that people feel better and people are more engaged in doing their work. And we can't take for granted what students are doing and what families are doing to make it through each day. So verbalizing the life skills that they're using to engage is really important, whether it's coworkers or the students or our families. So recognizing their problem solving skills, verbalizing that, recognizing that they're taking care of themselves through their appearance, meeting deadlines, 
there's really an endless number of ways that we can uh, tap into our students' strengths by giving them positive messaging. And then academic adjustments. So during this time, I mean, we know that it is really hard to maintain motivation. We, we also know that um, things like uh, cheating and um, relying on methods that may not be healthy for our students' academic achievement is happening during this time. So anything that we can do to ensure that students are engaging in learning and maintaining their integrity, it really does fall on the adults around them to support them in that. And so when students have those learning challenges, we need to make sure that we're proactively planning with those students, um, perhaps changing assignments, uh, changing deadlines, adjusting what gets turned in, um, and then also making sure that if we are doing assessments that we are tapping into what our students can manage while at the same time holding the bar high. So that could mean, um, as I put down, rescheduling tests or offering tests over multiple days, um, obviously being true to an IEP or a 504 plan, but we might need to extend even farther than what um, is written in order to see what our students know and have learned. So planting the seeds for new growth and rejuvenation is an everyday task. We as educators and parents wanna make sure that we are acting in such a way that our children can see that we are also trying to be the change we wanna see in the world. And we wanna make sure that they know that they have the personal power to be the change that they want to see in the world around them. Some days are harder than others and some challenges are bigger than others. So our students need to know that each day is a new day, just as we do as educators. So when the struggle is real and supportive conversations, when the struggle is real, we, we as adults have to become comfortable with sadness and distress. We have to be able to listen and be present. So what that could look like is a student either over the phone or virtually or in person brings to you a significant issue that has occurred either in school or at home. Sometimes we fall into the trap of wanting to solve it immediately. And so what I'm asking uh, is that we first be present and listen. And that's true for each other as well. Don't try to solve it in the moment. Take in what they're trying to communicate and help them breathe through it or help them uh, take time to gain perspective. So that means that we don't necessarily insist on, you know, cheer up, brush it off, um, you know, stiff upper lip. These are truly challenging times and can be very emotionally overwhelming to um, both children, teenagers, and adults. So avoiding the urge to self-disclose when students bring very significant information, it, by self-disclosing, especially if it's a situation where you have had a very similar experience, the student may feel that, um, or the adult may feel that you're not really listening or that you're trying to project onto the situation. Um, so we would say that you don't know exactly how they feel. Um, Rather give language to the words that they are or the feelings that they are experiencing. Don't pass judgment, keep your head clear, um, keep, keep perspective because some of the situations that our students are in, we know 
um, they are often doing the very best they can, just as their parents um, are often doing the very best they can to provide for their children. And of course, if there are situations that our students are in or that our colleagues are in that involve their personal safety, their personal health, uh, suicide, any of those things, those require obviously immediate intervention. And follow, following whatever practices or policies or procedures are in place within a school building um, are really important. Um, if things are happening outside of the school building, um, then it really falls on um, all of us as community members to reach out to that student, family, adult, whatever it is, to provide the support they need to get the resources in place that they need. And then on the other side, having supportive conversations, what do they look like? So um, we are super aware that body language and expression plays um, the greatest um, part of looking at how a person responds to a conversation. So I have to make sure that my tone and my body language are open and aware and listening. Taking the time to be in the moment can be really hard if there's lots of things going on. But if a student um, or family member or coworker is disclosing to us, we have to make sure that we take time to acknowledge what's going on. Obviously listening um, and limiting personal sharing and then make sure that you are offering what is practical um, based on the needs of yourself and the classroom and um, the larger family that you might be working with. And then of course, following up. Following up can look very different depending on the situation, but no matter how small, we need to make sure that we're building that trust by following up. So everyday stress versus feeling overwhelmed. Everyday stress. So <laughs> I kind of chuckle because during this time, right? It is so, so many things happening day to day uh, that change rapidly in the world around us that it can lead to both day-to-day -day stress or chronic stress, depending on what a family um, or student is dealing with. So everyday stress really, really looks like short-term. Um, it may have, it may be just enough stress that keeps you motivated and keeps you going, um, provides enough stimulation to keep you focused on the tasks at hand, and that's true for our students. Or over time, it, it can negatively impact uh, how we're interacting in the world. So we know that a certain level of stress can be uh, healthy, can lead to um, further achievement. But we also know that if during this time, families have gone through significant periods of stress, that it can actually change their chemical composition, that it can impair cognitive functioning, uh, it can reduce your ability to manage your day, and can lead to habitual behaviors. And of course, we see this in some of our students who have unfortunately struggled to just engage um, in the school day at all. And it falls on us to, again, intervene when we're seeing chronic stress in our colleagues and with our students and families. So what can we do to empower internal strategies? Socially, we can do daily check-ins, community connections, especially now as more and more people are getting the vaccine, people are starting to feel comfortable um, being in smaller, group settings where they can actually socialize with family or friends. Having an awareness of the student 
and how they would typically act day to day. And if there are any changes in behavior, uh, making sure that we're acknowledging that and trying to find the right resources for that student at their comfort level. And then of course, more and more sporting events, clubs, organizations are figuring out really positive ways to engage students while keeping them safe. So there's a lot of things that happen virtually now, for example. I know drama clubs, for example, are using technology to record plays, for example, um, or musicals, or renting out um, spaces where the students can get together and be socially distant and still participate in those activities. And then individual empowering strategies, talking about it with students, talking about it around the dinner table, modeling and supporting self-regulation, healthy lifestyles, including exercise, uh, sleep patterns, uh, what we're eating. Uh, these are all things that we can help our students and each other do well and look out for each other. Self-care activities, spirituality, attending services, uh, whether you're uh, a prayerful person or someone who um, just wants to get out into nature, going for walks, just really encouraging each other to pursue those healthy uh, individual strategies. And I do wanna go back to just the sleep piece, which of course, has been really challenging for teenagers. I know many, many teenagers who uh, have very late night hours who are texting and communicating with their teachers at very odd hours. And so um, when those things happen, I really encourage the team that I work with to uh, reach out to those students and their families and see if there's any way that the school can help um, with those sleep patterns. I, we in the Syracuse City School District actually start our day later now for high school students. Uh, our day doesn't start until 845. And then they have about a 15 minute period of time where they're checking in with students, maybe doing a social emotional activity, and then class officially starts at nine. Uh, that's whether someone's in person or um, external. So making those adjustments. Environmental uh, strategies would be things like having the clear expectations, structure, awareness of what the struggles are for our students and families and for ourselves, understanding that there are more and more activities that are available and resources that are available. It's a question of linking um, our students and families to those resources. And also understanding that we are all in this together. So building social connections in a virtual world. What that looks like. So in order to take care of ourselves um, and other people, we first have to take care of ourselves. And what does that look? That means taking time to relieve stress and be mindful of our own limitations, what we can manage. And if we're starting to feel overwhelmed, what we can do to recharge our own batteries. So some ideas that I have put down and I'd love for people to put in the chat things that they do um, to, because if you do it, there's probably someone else who could use that idea. <laughs> So listening to music, calling a friend or speaking with family, doing virtual family meetings, uh, if your family is far away, uh, watching positive uh, movies or television shows, uh, journaling, cuddling with a pet, <laughs> turning off the news uh, can be really important. Some people um, have spoken a lot to me about getting oversaturated with negative news. So making sure that we're cognizant of that and turning it off if we need to. And then of course, prayer or meditation. Some other things that we can um, make sure that we're doing is setting boundaries of our time. Um, it is easy to work later 
It is easier to maybe if you're working from home, the day never ends because you don't shut off the computer. And so it is really important to make sure that we and our students understand that there has to be downtime. Sometimes I feel like students are getting still in this time too much homework based on how much work they're doing during the school day and how much time they're online. So setting aside time as a family can be really important and having open communication with school staff if, uh, there, if there is that disconnect around too much homework. So establishing routines, it's really hard during this time because we've been in this um, situation of the pandemic for so many months now to uh, reestablish positive routines. But even if we set one new goal a day to keep a positive routine, that helps everybody um, both in school and at home. And then of course, if you are working from home or if your student is working from home, um, they may be tired of the space that they've been in for months and months and months. So I challenge people often to look at the space that they have and see if it can be adjusted for a different view, for example, um, if they are 100% at home. So we can make connections by being culturally responsive to the families that we work with. Um, I know in Syracuse, for example, we have over 80 different languages spoken in our city, and I'm sure that is true across New York State. So making sure that as we're trying to connect with families that we're doing so in a way that respects um, their time and respects their cultural norms. Leading with social emotional wellness activities, and I've listed a handful of things that I know um, educators have used regularly during this time uh, to draw students in um, at their own comfort level. Of course, project-based learning is a wonderful tool and a wonderful way to help students um, get up from their desk, whether it's at school in a small group or um, at home and then using um, service learning, however that can look in that environment, because we know that when students feel like they're giving to each other or to their community, they feel better. And then making sure that if, if we are discussing the challenging events that are going on both here in the United States, as well as globally, that we set positive emotional ground rules that allow people to have safe conversations. So we're well into it, right? We have a lot of ways that we can collaborate as staff and rejuvenate each other. And we also can make it personal for each of our students in order for them to engage. So staff collaboration obviously can go across grade levels or across a building um, or across a district, depending on what we're looking to grow in our staff. Um, making sure that taking chances and opportunities to do things like you are today uh, and engage in further learning, that is one of the wonders of the uh, wonderful things about the pandemic is that we can easily engage in a lot of PD um, and much of it is free to us when it may not have been in the past. So um, parent to parent, for example, of New York State has been doing webinar after webinar and parent group after parent group to get together. So I would really encourage people to engage in those social forums that they may not have had the ability to connect with or time to connect with in the past. Making sure that we're sharing what we're learning and sharing lessons and inviting other adults to build those social networks for our students. And then of course, making it perso personal for our families and our students, setting a time, setting a time for one-on-one -on -one time, as well as routine office hours, 
also connecting over the phone or virtually or email, or if it is allowed in person, I call them front porch visits. <laughs> okay, so now I am going to try <laughs> to share this next slide. Okay, so what I want people to do is just take a moment to sit back and hopefully everything will work. <laughs> um, and you'll be able to hear this sound and I'm gonna rely on my uh, co-host to tell me if the sound is working. No, I'm not hearing anything. Uh, okay, let me stop that. Okay, let's try again. This was the one thing I was nervous about. <laughs> okay. What the world needs now is love, sweet love, it's the only thing that there's just too little love. But the world is now, is love, sweet love, no, not just for some, but for everyone. No, we don't need another mountain. There are mountains and hillsides enough to climb. There are oceans and rivers enough to cross, enough to last, enough to last till the end of time. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some, but for everyone. Lord, we don't need another meadow. There are cornfields and wheat fields enough to grow. There are sunbeams and moonbeams enough to shine. Oh, listen, Lord, if you want to know, if you want to know. Just for some, but for So I like to share that because I think it allows people to take a deep breath. And I think all of us recognize the power of music. So anytime we're in an environment where we can share music, especially schools, it allows our students to experience a positive emotional response to what they're hearing and allows all of us to kind of regroup and and I do think during this time, I'm not telling anyone anything they don't know about grace, but it really falls on all of us to acknowledge the challenges of this time and to give each other the grace that we deserve um, as we're interacting in the world and providing for our students. So, so a couple things about strength-based and trauma-sensitive communication. 
Um, it really does fall on us to be vigilant in our awareness of the fact that many of our students are going through daily traumas and that it falls on us to create those safe spaces so that they can not just engage in their learning, but move forward in their learning. And so what that could mean is helping them discover who they are and what they're good at and allowing them to experience that true human connection when they're in school, paying attention closely to their positive choices throughout the day, no matter how small they are, and acknowledging that and verbalizing that. Making sure that we are aware that social media really does impact how they view the world and how much they're on social media, how we can help them to engage in the world rather than just on those social media spaces. So it's our job, obviously, to create those spaces where they want to engage and provide activities that are developmentally appropriate for their age level to keep them focused on short-term goals and long-term goals. And then of course, trauma-sensitive communication and care requires that we focus on what happened when we're interacting with a student and not what I might think about what they did wrong or how they might have added to the situation or created the situation, rather providing that listening ear and then stepping forward in the recognition of the skills that they did use in that situation. Make sure that we see people, see people in the relation of being a close confidant, whether it's a colleague or a student, and that even though they may have difficult behaviors, and even though we have our own personal biases, that we first acknowledge what is happening for us so that we can help the student in the best way possible moving forward when they have had a significant trauma. So giving back control is really important and we have the power to do that. We also have the power of our language that helps support our students and our colleagues and our families. So giving back control, what that looks like, even though the world can be very uncertain is acknowledging and providing coping strategies. It can be helping the student to gain control um, as a direct result of tapping into positive strategies. I had a student the other day who was on a Zoom, uh, a Zoom interview with me and they were in their home and they had to change locations and the student was very frazzled and kind of yelling at their family in the background and they walked into another room, sat down on the bed and went like this. I was incredibly impressed because they had to readjust and they're a teenager um, in a really difficult situation in the sense that it wasn't difficult that their family was around, but they were trying to do a, a full-fledged interview with me. So anyways. Uh, setting personal boundaries and making sure that you know what your personal buttons are, what makes you upset, especially in the classroom setting or online, if you are interrupted. And then making sure that we recognize individual student potential, not holding on to what might have happened the day before, the week before, the month before with the students and families that we're working with. Um, or with our colleagues, it comes back again to being in the moment and being present. And then helping you through co-regulation. So what that means is that I know that what I project matters to the student. And so if I'm able to stay calm in that moment, they're that much more likely to either regain composure or work through to a space where they can be calm enough to work through the situation with me. And then I put up some references and links 
um, that uh, many of you are probably familiar with, um, but are wonderful resources uh, altogether uh, for more information about parenting, more information about professional uh, school skills that you can tap into. Um, I just really, these, these websites are hands down some of my very favorite when it comes to mental health supports. Uh, so should we, should we move to any questions or? So we'll read out the first one that we had in the chat. Um, someone asked, can you explain more about the homemade smash book resources and directions? Ah, yes. Okay. So Smashbook, if, if you are a member of Pinterest, um, that is one place to go and gain information about Smashbooks or simply Google it. They are um, books that allow students to put together um, collages with writing, uh, photos, whatever is important to the student that allows them to reflect on some of the skills that they have, as well as some of the goals that we that they could set. So it's very much uh, active journaling kind of book that is individually created by students. But yes, there's a ton of, uh, a wealth of information on uh, Pinterest, if you're a member of Pinterest, or you can simply Google it and find some great resources. And then we had a couple comments as well. First of all, lots of uh, positive reactions to the, the music. Um, <laughs> someone else stated that they thought it was an excellent point early on about being careful not to dis uh, self-disclose when a youth shares or discloses information to an adult. Um, and then we had some folks who responded with their um, calming and relaxation strategies. Um, so planning and dreaming, Excellent. taking Epsom baths, uh, salt mm -hmm. baths at the end of a long day. And then we had two people who both said that um, connecting in parent groups or Facebook support groups has been very helpful to them. Yes, and I do like to just remind all of us as adults, those examples of like taking baths and things like that. Um, when we set that example in the home, then our kids are that much more likely to recognize that they need to do that as well. So I love hearing other examples of um, what people can do because our, our children don't necessarily think of those things. And it falls on us to, to share those things and to have, especially in the classroom environment, when if there is social emotional time that is set aside, like we have here, um, to help students see those things and what they can have control over, um, especially in the home environment, um, you know, finding ways that they can feel happy uh, in the home environment, especially if they're not able to um, get out and about in the community. And then that's all we have in the chat for now, but I'll remind okay. people you can submit your questions in the chat box, or if you called in via the telephone, you can unmute yourself to ask a, ask a question by pressing star six. So I stopped screen share so I could see the chat. <laughs> yeah, so that piece of music was written after the very tragic event in Orlando. Um, they recorded that as a fundraiser. And we have another comment from someone saying that um, it was a very nice talk and that they love the website links that were made available. Yes, yes. And, you know, I touched briefly on social media and 
I think we all can acknowledge as a group of uh, both parents and educators that monitoring social media is a true challenge, both during the school day, um, as well as when kids are home, because we went through that very significant many months of time where really that was the only way that students could regularly communicate with each other and see each other. And so a lot of really strong habits were formed around engaging over social media. And it does take time and energy to bring that back and to set good boundaries around social media. It really does, it really does take time and focus and then having things that you can provide that aren't social media related to, to fill their time. I, I have two teenage daughters and I will say that they often are like, well, I'm bored. And so I do have my little list of lots of things that we could be doing together to um, keep them off that social media <laughs> really hard. And then again, in regard to the websites, are those uh, resources that are geared towards adults or, or children? If, and if they're geared towards adults, do you have recommendations for additional um, resources for children? Yeah, so um, they are geared toward adults. Um, th there, there are some wonderful resources as far as um, activities to provide for, for children. Um, I, uh, so I often use growth mindset activities with students and those can be found um, to be based on developmental stages for the kids. So yes, so websites that typically have growth mindset activities are great for kids to tap into. That's all I'm seeing in the chat for now, but I'll remind okay. you one more time, if you do have any questions, you can submit them right in the chat link, or if you're on the telephone, unmute by pressing star six. Well, thank you very, very much, everyone, for coming today and listening, and uh, feel free to um, reach out to me if if you have any further questions, be happy to engage with people.